Hi and welcome. I have no idea why I'm doing this. Actually, of course, I know why I'm doing this. It's because Brute Fork challenged me to create a Krell patch, but you know, <laughs> here, look at this. That's the patch. And the amount of color doesn't mean that it's going to be simple this time. <laughs> Actually, you know, I think it's it's the most complex thing I've ever done. Today, <laughs> you're going to see a lot, a hell lot of modulation and modifier and binary slaughtering left and right. I know, of course, you, says, you subscribe to this channel to see this. I, I know that, you love that. But just imagine being me. Okay. It, complaining doesn't help at all. Okay, let's, let's get started. What are we going to do today? I want to recreate together with you um, the Krell sound on a Wald of Blofeld synthesizer. What does that mean? What What is actually Krell or Krell? Well, it's a name from the classic 1956 movie Forbidden Planet, by the way, starring Leslie Nielsen. But it's not a comedy movie, it's a science fiction movie and the Krell is an alien species. And this alien species in that 1956 movie has its own sound. And it's an electronic soundtrack. It's indeed one of the very first electronic soundtracks ever. And responsible for that soundtrack are Louis and Bebe Baron. These two people were creating electronic music way before it was cool. I encourage you to listen to that Krell patch or Krell soundtrack. You can find the videos on YouTube. I don't want to, to include this to get in copyright problems, but you should definitely listen to the original because it's fascinating with um, which equipment or possibilities Louis and Bebe Baron created this piece of music because again it was 1956. This patch is often associated with modular synthesizers, sometimes with Buchla modular systems, but actually Don Buchla founded his company six years later in 1962. I think the first EMS VCS3 or Putney was released around 1968 something and the Mini MOOC came on the market in 1970. So what they were using were simple sign signal generators from a laboratory environment and magnetic tapes. By modulating all these equipment, recording it, playing around with tape recorders, cutting the tapes into pieces, rearranging the pieces and using multiple recorders with one tape to achieve a delay effect. They were playing around, fooling around, creating this, yeah, you have to say masterpiece, taking in, into consideration in which era it was created. And you should definitely hear the original one especially to have a clue what we want to achieve, what's, what's the goal actually. When you have a care listen to this soundtrack, you can hear um, mostly two different types of sounds. I could um, detect two layers, one rather lower and rather faster bouncing sound, and on top of that a theremin-like sound. So we have like two layers and 
a little bit of vibrato, but the important thing is that we have a very irregular bouncing. This type of sound can be described as layer toric, or to put it in simpler words, you could also say with randomness. And the randomness in this patch is um, how the notes are played. So clearly we cannot use the arpeggiator because we cannot make the arpeggiator faster and slower while we are playing it. And on top of that, I want to recreate this patch with only the one blowfield patch, not using the multi-mode at all. So we are going to create foremost two layers, the low bouncing layer and then the theremin layer. And in order to achieve this very random aleatoric note playing, um, we cannot rely on the arpeggiator. We have to find a different solution. Yeah. So let's get started. So things are going to get very complicated this time. Let me program the patch and afterwards, or at least the layer, and afterwards I want to explain with the help of my um, modulation modifier simulator what I just did. Okay, so let's start with oscillator one, of course with a fresh new patch. This is a sine wave oscillator. As I said, they were using sine wave generators from electronic laboratories as their sound sources back then. And um, I'm going to decrease the level to zero. I put the octave to 32, as I said. We are going to program the low bouncing noise first. Then in filter one, I'm reducing the cutoff to 83. I'm modulating the panning with LFO2 with the amount of 45. Then in the amp envelope, we are just increasing the release to 110. And please remember, we are going to program both layers in one patch, which means that we cannot really use the filter envelope or the amp envelope for some modulation because they would affect both layers in the same manner, but they, we want them to be independent. So we just increase the release time so that we have as much space in um, in the sound and in the in the time as possible and then we can adjust the true envelopes um, correspondingly just as we need it okay that was the amp envelope now envelope three will be responsible for the bouncing noise we are changing the mode to loop all the attack level to 65. That is very important. Attack 0, attack level 65. Decay should be 58. Sustain 0, decay 2, 0, decay, uh, sustain 2, also 0, release 0. So that is going to be our actual amp envelope for the first layer for the low bouncing noise we can also um, apply this envelope in the modulation matrix to oscillator one as the first modulation um, in the first modulation slot i want to add some vibrato which you heard in the original as well with 17 And in the second modulation slot, we are going to use envelope three to control the level of oscillator 
1. All the way up to 63. Until this point, you couldn't hear oscillator 1, because we turned it all the way down. Now we are increasing the level again with our fake amp envelope, envelope 3. And because it's a loop type, and because it has this, uh, sorry, it has this um, typical Tom-like shape, you can hear... Um, this typical sound. But now we want different node length and different decay times, right? So let's try that. Now I'm going to our modifier one. I'm using the envelope 3 in combination with a constant value of 32 with the AND operation. Okay, and in modifier 2 I'm using LFO2 with a constant value of 63 with an XOR. Now to make everything more confusing, let's go back to our LFOs and set them to a speed of 15. And the second LFO is a sample at hold type with speed 0. As you may know, sample at hold with speed 0 means that you play a note and the random value is held all the, all the time because the speed is 0. And when you play a new note, it's recombining, giving us a new value. But as I said, we are actually not playing new notes, we are holding a note. And that's a problem, because we don't get any recombination of the LFO2. Let's add more modulations. In modulation slot 3, I'm using modifier 1 to modulate LFO2 speed. With the maximum amount. In the fourth slot, I'm using LFO2 to modulate oscillator one pitch with the amount of 38. And in the fifth slot, I'm using modifier 2 to modulate envelope 3 decay. With the amount of 40. And that's the result. And that's exactly what we wanted to achieve. But I'm quite sure that you cannot see what's happening there yet. Um, but I want to emphasize one thing. We created the loop envelope, envelope 3. And um, because the mode is loop all, this means that it goes through all the phases. And when one phase, like for instance, the decay gets longer, the loop takes a longer time to reach the starting point again. And exactly this, but by modulating envelope three decay, 
we can create longer and shorter notes. And one could say that we can use the output of LFO2, which is our sample and hold directly with a, let's say, faster speed than zero. Because as I said, when I, when I press the key and I hold the note, the value does not change. So the decay wouldn't change. But by making the sample and hold faster, it would um, change the decay time of envelope 3 even if I hold the key. But this doesn't quite work and I want to show you why. Actually, not in this setting, but in a different setting. Oh, I, I think that's not, that's not bright enough. Can you see me? I think you cannot see me, but, but don't worry. I cannot see you either. It's only important that you can see the blowfield. I, I changed the setting to red to emphasize that this is not the way how you should do it. Okay, n no matter. Um, I said we want to modulate the decay time of envelope 3. And you could think that you should use LFO2, which is a sample and hold, with a slightly decreased speed to modulate the decay time and the length of the note directly. So this is LFO2 and this would be modulation slot number 2, which is LFO2 modulating the decay directly and this is the result. You have to hear to this example carefully, but when you do so, you can hear that we have some problems with that. Because LFO2 and Envelope 3 are independent from each other, which means that um, LFO2 is changing its value all the time. And um, the decay time starts independently from that which means that the decay starts and the value of LFO2 could switch, which means that suddenly the decay becomes longer or shorter, but it does not play the correct decay from start to end, or let's say one, one constant decay, but the decay time changes all the time. Listen to that carefully. So it's a simpler solution, of course, but the decay is not perfect. And if you want a better result, then stay tuned. Let's switch back <laughs> to, to the actual setting. Here we are back again. Okay, now you know why applying LFO2 directly to envelope 3 decay doesn't quite work. But what can we do? And the solution is modifier. So let's move to the modifier simulator so I can more or less show you what's happening. Because here we are going to reach 
even the ends of this beautiful software. All right, if you're not familiar with this software, it's a simple visualization of what's happening within the blowfield with LFOs, modifiers, and so on. So you have modulation sources here, your modifiers here, and more display parameters here. So what we are using is envelope three. Let's choose an envelope. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the actual envelope three because the modifier simulator does not have an envelope which starts at the value of 65. And that's a problem. Here in this picture, you can see it starts all the way up at 127. But that's not how envelope three actually looks. We choose to let it start somewhere at 65. And that's very important. Now let's take a constant value of 32, as we did in modifier one. I can also show you this constant value. And now I'm going to combine both sources with a modifier one with the AND operation. And that's the result. So as you can see here, the value is high and then low. And now you have to believe me because I cannot show it, but our envelope three starts at this point. This means that the result of modifier one is just a short time of a high value and then zero. And this means that modifier one outputs just a little peak and then nothing at the beginning of each note. Remember that. Now we can have a look on LFO2. So let's hide the amp envelope and modifier one. And let's set up the LFO, which is the sample and hold. Looks like this. So we have random values here. And now I'm using modifier two in combination with a constant value of 63 with the XOR and that's the result. Okay, so as you can see, sometimes we have high values of LFO2 and modifier 2 at the same time. Sometimes we have negative values of LFO2 and modifier 2 at the same time. And sometimes we have high values of LFO2 and low values of modifier 2 and vice versa. Almost two independent random sources. They are not quite independent because of course um, the modifier 2 output is dependent on LFO2 but it, does, it doesn't look like that. Now that you have seen the output of, or of both modifiers, I want to explain what is happening. First things first, modifier one outputs a little peak and then nothing at the beginning of each note. So with, with the attack of envelope three. Now have a look on our modulation matrix again. When you look right here, you can see that modifier one is modulating LFO2 speed. 
modifier 1 is this short high value. By applying a high value to LFO 2 speed, our static simple and hold, simple and hold it increases the speed of LFO 2, dicing and changing the values quickly and then immediately stopping, um, pulling the speed of LFO2 again down to zero, which means that LFO2 holds this value again for a long time until the next peak comes. And then there is a new recombination. That's simply throwing the dices. Modifier 1 has influence on LFO2 speed. And then LFO2 controls the pitch and by going through modifier 2 it also has control over envelope 3 decay. So envelope 3 goes into modifier 1 that goes into LFO2, that goes into modifier 2, and that goes into envelope 3. We have a modulation loop. <laughs> the modulation sources are modulating each other all the time. And as side effects, we are using the signal of envelope 3 also to derive the amp envelope of our first layer and we are using the value of LFO2 sometimes in form of the output of modifier 2 to change the pitch and the length of our notes. Don't say that I didn't warn you. <laughs> it is complicated but it's working. And it's beautiful. Now let's have a look on the second layer, the theremin type sound. And of course, we are applying the same tricks here as well. Okay, let's start with oscillator 2. That is a sine wave oscillator as well. Of course, with level 0, we are applying um, envelope 4 this time as the amp envelope. Let's go directly to envelope 4, setting this also to a loop all type, changing the attack level to 0 this time, decay to 0, sustain to 0, decay 2 to just 2. That's important, otherwise it wouldn't work with 0, so we need something like 2. It's maybe a bug, but I don't want to say anything. So it's important to set this thing to 2. Sustain can remain and release to 100. And now we are going to use LFO3 again with a sample and hold with speed 0. And as you may guess, we are going to modifiers three and four. Modifier three has envelope four as the modulation source and is using the end operation with a constant value of 32 again. And LFO three is the modulation source combined with LFO, no sorry, combined with a constant value of 63 again, the same trick as with LFO2. So we get new random values. They're not really random, but um, they're so 
unpredictable for us that we consider them as random. Exoring it, of course. So I'm not going to show you these modifiers in the simulator because it's quite the same as um, we did it with, with the first layer. Yeah, modifier one is working like modifier three and modifier two is working like modifier four. And now let's go to our modulation slots. Modulation six is envelope four modulating oscillator two level with 45. So now you can hear the second layer. In modulation seven, we're using modifier three as the source for LFO3 speed. With maximum amount, again, we get a new peak, a new impulse, short, high value, just to recombine our sample and hold LFO and keep it then in the following low section um, on a constant value. And then we can also modulate um, the pitch and the duration of um, the second layer notes by modulating with LFO3 the pitch of oscillator 2. Let's say with 40. And using modifier 4. for the release time of envelope four with 20. One more thing we can do to get a more authentic feeling is to use the noise oscillator with a level of 7 and a balance to, to the second filter with a slightly increased color to add some, some noise to the sound so it gets so, th so that you get the same feeling as listening to the original, which is, of course, also very noisy. As you know, our first entry in the modulation slot was the pitch vibrato. So what we can add in the modulation matrix is one more entry, which is LFO3 having influence on the speed of LFO1 with the amount of 63. So we can get um, many different um, accelerations in the vibrato. You could also let um, LFO2 control the vibrato, but um, I would rather take LFO3 
because the vibrato is more obvious and can be heard better in the higher notes so that the higher notes and their um, recombination pace should have the influence on the LFO speed. And changing LFO speeds in the low bouncing noise is not that easy to hear as in higher pitch sounds. Finally, we can decide whether we want to add delay or reverb. Listening carefully to the original, I would guess that they're using both at least some kind of delay and some kind of reverb. I choose to add some reverb. So I'm not using effect one at all. I'm going directly to the reverb with just a little mix of 15, high pass of five, low pass of 70, with a diffusion of 60, size of 54, shape all the way up, decay of 110, and damping to 90. One more thing you may notice in the original example is that we have more than just two layers. We have several notes playing at once, even several higher notes. So actually I didn't say quite the truth. We can use the arpeggiator, but not to get the actual notes, their length and their values, but to get more notes played at once to get to to make the sound more dense so let's go to the arpeggiator section and here you, we can choose um, the mode on or hold reduce the clock to three whole bars which is very long and the length to 10 bars. So we get very long played notes in a very slow arpeggiator. The, so every three bars we get a press on a key which is held for 10 bars and every keystroke gives us these bouncing noises and the theremin um, notes. That's the result. And that's the patch. Let's sum it up quickly, okay? So we have two layers of sounds. One is the low bouncing sound, one is the theremin-like sound. We cannot use the arpeggiator because the arpeggiator plays regular notes, but we want to have irregular notes. 
So the only chance we have is to use the envelopes 3 and 4 in a loop mode and adjusting the decay time and the release time to get different length of the notes and uh, to get this aleatoric element. But in order to get different values, we have to modulate them with the sample and hold LFOs. But again, <laughs> if we want to have constant values, which are um, recombined with every of the envelope keystrokes, we have to derive a short high signal from the envelope generators. And this high signal is changing the speed of LFO2 and LFO3 rapidly, but just for a short time, like throwing the dices. And then, after they have recombined, the value will remain constant again as long as the envelopes play. And at the same time, we are using the outputs of LFO2 and LFO3 XORT with a constant value to derive even more pseudo random values for further modulation. One thing that you, or maybe some of you, um, don't understand yet is that I'm using the binary operations in the modifiers the AND operation and the XOR. And the AND operation works because the value of each envelope, envelope 3 and 4, are jumping over this line of 46, uh, 64. And um, on one hand, the AND operation works because the value is going over a certain threshold causing one of the higher value bits to turn into one and the constant value 32 is simply a one with zeros putting this with an end operation on the envelope value results in a one otherwise in a zero. You can, you can try to watch the binary values here in the, in the simulator. Let's go back to our example with sources one and two and modifier one. And you can turn on the calculations. And let's let's start this thing. And pause it. And for every value you can see exactly the calculation. So I can start it again with a reset. You can play it. And there you can see here we have a one value, a one bit, and this with the end operation means that only when here is also a bit number one, we get a one, otherwise we get only zeros. And this, <laughs> the envelope three value 65, is this higher value which causes this first bit to be one. And then the binary output of modifier one is not zero, but zero one zeros or 32. 
I know it would take some time for some of you to understand that. You can also consider watching my um, video about um, the binary operations in the Blofeld and how um, binary calculation in general works. Maybe it, it can help you. But we can also have a look on modifier 2 as well. As you remember, this was um, the combination of um, the combination of LFO2 with a constant value of 63. And you can see that with the XOR you get very random values. You can also start the simulator and then you can see very random binary values here which are causing very random uh, final values, the output of modifier 2. I know this was a complicated lesson. I hope you enjoyed this video or at least um, watched it being fascinated by what's possible, not understanding what's, what's happening at all. Or maybe you understood. Um, either way, you can leave a comment in the comment section. You can leave a like if you like this video. Um, if you have um, questions about what I did, and I'm sure there are going to be many questions, um, you can simply post them. I'm going to try to answer your questions, um, but I can promise nothing. Okay. Uh, leave a like, make a comment. Um, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos, um, especially on the Blowfield topic, don't forget to subscribe. You can also choose um, to join as a channel member. Um, with a membership you get access to even more sick videos like this one. Um, you get access to the Blowfield modifier simulator and you get even access to some of the sounds which I created for this beautiful machine. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. And maybe take some rest because it was... I know it was complicated. Just relax and chill. Take a bath. Don't forget to sleep well, that's important. Good sleep is, is important. Yeah. Yeah.